Ladies and gentlemen, on today's show, we interview the co-founder of the literary agency of choice for Elon Musk's best-selling biography. Her literary agency has also represented the best-selling book, Ready Player One. The legendary comic book genius Stan Lee's books, the smash hit, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a What? And a book that just keeps on selling, You Are a Bad What? How to Stop Doubting Your Greatness and Start Living an Awesome Life, etc. My friends, FoundryMedia.com represents the authors of the books that you know. Today, the woman I simply call The Ephot shares with us how she was able to start her successful literary agency during a nuclear winter of publishing, how the publishing industry works, the habits that make her super successful, how authors get paid their royalties, how she keeps track of all the royalty payments owed to her, why she likes to start with a crazy idea when working with her authors, why she believes that you need to always focus on operating at your highest and best use, the role book publishers play in an author's career, why you must be compromising in relationships but uncompromising with your career, her advice to female businesswomen about staying proactive and much, much more. Ladies and gentlemen, this interview blew my mind. Without any further ado, I present to you our interview with my friend, Ifat. Some shows don't need a celebrity narrator to introduce the show, but this show does. Two men, eight kids, co-created by two different women, 13 multi-million dollar businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Thrive Time Show. Now, three, two, one. Yes, yes, and yes, Thrive Nation. On today's show, we are interviewing a super guest, a super humble lady who happens to be, in my in my humble opinion, one of our planet's top literary agents. Miss Efot, welcome on to the Thrive Time Show. How are you, ma'am? I'm so well. Thanks so much for having me on. Hey, I want to ask you this because you've had a lot of success, and I know you don't like to name drop, and I know you don't like to brag on yourself or your organization, but can you share just a few of the titles of the books that your organization has put out uh, over the years? I know there's so many, but some of the ones that maybe more listeners would know or some of the titles that are, you know, the perennial bestsellers. Well, of course, every one of our clients' books is one of my favorites, but in terms of terrific books, some of your clients, uh, some of your listeners might yeah. uh, uh have uh, awareness of is, for example, one of my favorites, which is a science fiction book called Ready Player One, which imagines a dystopian world that's sort of Willy Wonka set in the gamer world. We love um, some of our sort of learn while you're being entertained titles like The Girls of Atomic City, which tells us the untold uh, story of the contribution of women to the Manhattan Project. So, and so, so as you're reading about this incredibly harrowing story, you're actually learning about nuclear physics. Um, and ditto by the same author, whose name is Denise Kiernan, uh, I Love the Last Castle, which tells you the untold story of the uh, lady of the house of the Biltmore estate. Uh, everybody knows that it's a massive house in North Carolina, but little did you know about the tremendous contribution of all kinds of women, both the Lady of the House and others, in keeping that private house from meeting the wrecking ball. And again, you finish this harrowing tale, and then you realize, boy, I know a lot about architecture now. Again, it's just slipped yeah. in there. But some of our other titles are uh, The Subtle Art of Not Getting an F, or You Are a Badass, <laughs> with a wonderful... Um, biography of Elon Musk, yeah. uh, who's, of course, the founder of SpaceX and Tesla, um, and uh, so many others. You have a hit list. It's just massive. You, if you're listening today and you go to foundrymedia.com, look for the, for the list of the books that they have helped to produce and to bring to market. And if you find a book that you love that you've already read, go leave it a review. But Ifat, your success can be intimidating and overwhelming for some of our uh, aspiring entrepreneurs out there. So I, I'd love for you to share with us uh, where your career where your career began and, and uh, what it was like to start from the bottom. Um, I, I was super lucky. I mean, like most people, I spent, you know, three plus years on my school paper uh, writing, but also editing my peers. I, I, I love storytelling, 
but I also really love the process of working with other writers um, and learning from them, frankly. And that ultimately led me to this job. And what do you, what can you explain to the listeners out there what a literary agency does? I mean, what does what is Foundry's role, or maybe just kind of because I think people don't realize what a publisher does, what an author does, and an agent does. Can you kind of explain what you do? Sure. So think about um, a literary agent as the connector between someone who's got something to say, and that could be, by the way, a novelist writing, you know, work of fiction, or a uh, you know, a professional like yourself or an expert in the field who, you know, has some kind of unique piece of information that could be useful to somebody else. Those two people are both authors, even though one has 100%, you know, uh, fingertips on the keyboard, and somebody else may come to writing in a different kind of way as a business professional, um, maybe even with somebody who is a co-writer with them or a ghostwriter. All of those things are acceptable to be called author because you're conveying information that only you can give. My job is to help connect you to a professional in the trade publishing business who can help you bring your words to more people. Now, I want to be really clear. Uh, when I say the trade publishing business, that's not all publishing, and that's not all writing. Right? Anybody can write anything, and if they have a connection to, a, uh, to the ultimate reader, meaning they have their own distribution system, they may or may not choose to work through traditional trade publishing that has a pretty narrow mandate about what they know how to sell in a big enough way where it makes it worth their while to sell it. But there are plenty of people who do not engage with traditional trade publishing who are nonetheless incredibly successful writers and have a very uh, enviable relationship with their readership. But to the extent somebody is right for traditional trade publishing, uh, they generally like, uh, they work with a literary agent because most trade publishers require someone like me to both be a tastemaker who allows them to narrow the playing field of what they have to consider in any given year, and also be a go-between and, and help um, often an uninitiated um, author, navigate a pretty confusing world of new terms, of new business practices, um, and in general, you know, allow the, the author to have the kind of, of uh, good publishing experience that makes them want to do it again. You know, Mary, Marianne Zillner from the Today Show had so many great things to say about you before she introduced uh, me to you. Marianne uh, Zillner is one of the producers of the Today Show, and you have such a great... Um, uh, resume of being consistent and diligent. Are, are you perfect? No, I'm not saying you are, but um, you've had this has a lot of success. Um, when did you figure out that you wanted to be diligent about this industry? When did you decide, okay, I want to put my energy, my focus, my time, my, uh, pow my passion, all of it in behind one thing? When did you decide that you wanted to do this professionally? Uh, you know, I mean, look, as an entrepreneur, I think that um, you never have to choose, right? I don't know a single entrepreneur who ever knows for sure this is it and this is what I want to do professionally. We do a gut check with ourselves in the moment and uh, in a manner that takes into account an evolving world um, to figure out whether we, what we feel like where we're putting our efforts in today is right. The advantage to that is that we always challenge ourselves to stay at the bleeding edge of whatever is going on so that we're contributing mm. in the best way possible. And I, I know that I love working with creatives and with experts in their field. Marianne Zoller from the Today Show is certainly one of those. She's, uh, uh, she's the New York Times bestselling author of, if I may say, Shouty Mom, uh, <laughs> a series of books and um, a, an entire franchise of, uh, of paper goods. She's had a number of, um, uh, a number of TV deals as well. Um, she loves, she came to me with a terrific idea for a, a new way of, of telling the story about what moms are going through. And she was super early to this. Um, and my job was to help her and her co-authors tell that story in a compelling way and connect them with a, um, a partner who was going to help them get it out in the biggest way possible. So I love translating the process of what a professional like Marianne uh, does or what the vision that she has 
for the publishing business, but I also love the adaptation into other art forms like TV and film and audio products. Whatever the new version of conveying information is, my job is to stay ahead of it and honestly, like, bring new ideas to the people who come to me and say, like, how about a book? Well, I'll say, like, well, that sounds like an interesting idea. How about a podcast first? Then we go into book because that allows us to come into book in a bigger way, right? Uh, so what and how I do as a professional uh, as a, you know, who is an advocate for creatives and experts um, will always evolve and should. How did, how, did you get for, how did you first get started in the industry? Did you, uh, were you an intern somewhere? Did you uh, wait in the lobby of some big publisher, um, pick some big literary agency until you got your break? Did you uh, wait tables? Were you creating uh, nuclear devices using coconuts? How, how, did you, how did you get started? I entered the uh, business in a non-traditional way. Um, my career began, I began as a lawyer and I ended up lateraling into um, the, what was then sucking up every professional, uh, the um, dot-com industry. But eventually I started a small press that focused on how-to nonfiction. And that um, press division met with some early success and the list of books that we put out was bought out by bigger publishers. Um, when it was time to decide what to do next, my own agent asked me if I would consider joining the agency that had represented me. Uh, and to be honest, I, I miss client advocacy. And um, we eventually started Foundry together. Wow. Now, when you start a literary agency, was this in an apartment? Were you starting it in a condo? Did you have an office? Did you work out of your car? I, get, get us into some of those nitty-gritty details because it's just so unapproachably awesome what you've built. And I just think I want to, I know the listeners out there want, want me to ask that. How, how, wh where did you start? I, I know that there's a, a great tradition of starting lean, and we certainly did that. But because we knew that we'd be bringing on uh, colleagues, and we were really we were feathering a nest that was going to not just hopefully be a great place for authors, but also we wanted to attract other professionals who were advocates like us. And in order to do that, we educated ourselves about what would be, uh, what would make the best possible home for other agents like us. What did they need and how could we create an ecosystem that provided them with those things that they needed uh, so that they could focus on, on client care. And so to do that, we created the uh, physical plant that we wanted to be in and that we knew met the needs um, of the folks that we were hoping to attract based on very nearly two years of, um, of, t of taking really of surveys, right, of what, what people who yeah. we were hoping to attract wanted. I think um, you've only made the mistake of letting me in your building one time. And uh, actually twice, because we were there, we left, we got some incredible uh, fresh-pressed juice, you and my wife there, and uh, we, we came back. We, we ate organic. But when I came back, I saw the Millennium Falcon in your office there, and it's kind of a, how would you describe the decor, the, the mojo, the, 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 the patina of your office now? How would you describe that? I remember the Millennium Falcon. Oh, yeah, well, um, uh, I think what you're referring to is on the first uh, anniversary of the business, I gifted my business partner this uh, vignette of a millennial Falcon and two X-wing fighters. Oh yeah. Sort of mid-flight. He had this really terrific um, way of explaining to other agents when uh, one, how one manages all the terrific creatives that you're working with. How do you know which uh, client to focus on at any given time? And his description was really, you know. It, it is not true to the George Lucas uh, narrative as it appears in episode four, A New Hope, but I'll, I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase it, which is you are in the Millennium Falcon, you're flanked by a bunch of X-Wing fighters, you're headed towards the Death Star, and there are some X-Wing fighters that are far behind you, there's some beside you, there's some in front of you, uh, each one of them has a payload for, you know, for um, uh, destroying the Death Star, and so depending on whether someone's behind you, meaning they're still working on their proposal or their book, whether they're beside you, they really need attention from you mm. to sort of, you know, to sort of shoot forward, or whether they're actually like the, the one Luke Skywalker who's, you know, getting ready to, you know, to sort of head it and try to, you know, drop the explosive. 
that is the way that you identify who needs your attention at the moment. And that's how you're able to give everybody what, what you need. In any event, I presented this to him. And really, the, the entire, uh, it hangs outside of his office, just over the door. You have gained traction now, so now you're sort of, there's sort of a, a momentum, which you have to keep up every day. But there's a sort of a momentum you've created. But it can feel really lonely. I work with a lot of clients where it's very lonely when they have no momentum. They have no reviews, no previous customers. A big idea that was cool six months ago. They're running out of cash. And you guys pushed through that threshold of Hades. Uh, when did you feel like you were first starting to gain traction with Foundry Media? Well, it should be noted that we started the business in o, in 07, 2007. Mm -hmm. And that was really the start of, you know, the most recent sort of nuclear winter in publishing where we opened up an office and all of a sudden, you know, the investment business, which is a big business here in, in, in New York, but also as a corollary, the publishing business, just the bottom fell out. And we could have looked at it as, a terrible mistake to have started a business in what turned out to be a horrible climate. Yeah. But in fact, what we realized was it was our greatest opportunity. We were a new business with no backlist, meaning no uh, royalty bearing books from earlier seasons. And all of our competitors had that money coming in from earlier seasons. We were starting from scratch. Um, it, we were also uh, at that time um, an agency that was focused on more, uh, commercial, uh, pop culture, sort of new um, idea publishing, as opposed to storied literary fiction from a hundred years back. That you know, was in, that we continue to enjoy, of course, as readers. And uh, had we been around a hundred years, maybe we would have been lucky enough to have. But we didn't have that revenue to to float us. And so we had to do two things. One is to hustle, to bring in as much money as possible in with with the new kinds of books that we hoped people would embrace. Yeah. And our luck was that in this climate, in this nuclear winter climate, those are exactly the books that publishers wanted to buy. But the other lucky thing that, that happened that we really grew to believe was, was an in incredible opportunity for us was that it was uh, that nuclear winter was an opportunity for us to pick up talent and colleagues, right? Colleagues that, um, who's published, whose homes at other agencies were no longer available to them. And that actually superpowered our growth. So you, you mentioned bringing in money in the nuclear winter. You got to bring in as much money as possible. I, I'm not asking for you to share how much money you make. I just, could you explain how a literary agent gets paid? I think a lot we have uh, a disproportionate amount of potential authors or authors that listen to our show. We have a lot of, we had a, some really neat, we had a gentleman who has his own show on the History Channel the other day who came into, j actually just this morning, came into Elephant in the Room, our men's grooming lounge, our, our, our new Oklahoma City story, just came in today, and they listened to the show, and it's just kind of a fun, there's a lot of authors out there. Um, how do you get paid? How does the author get paid? Kind of break down that a little bit so the listeners out there can have some clarity about the industry. Sure. Well, so uh, just as a, uh, a clarification point, what I'm describing here is just for the trade publishing industry. Trade, okay. colloquially, is something you might see at a bookstore. So not a professional book, not a, an academic book, but really something that you would see at your local terrific bookseller, um, offline or online. Um, those kinds of books have a, a price listed on the cover. That is called the list price. In business, you would call that the gross. An right. um, author gets paid a royalty of, generally speaking, 15% on a hard cover, 15% so of that list price Got it. Um, on a hard cover, and about 7.5% on a paperback. I'm generalizing terrifically. And I apologize for painting you into a corner. I just want to – and then do you get paid anything? Oh, do you get paid per, per book or, or per deal? Or how, do, how do you get paid? Well, I, the reason I went into how an author gets paid is because yeah. I get paid the way an author gets paid. Mm. I'm, a, I'm a partner to the author, and I am paid 15% of what I bring you for a domestic deal. Domestic, uh, with all due respect to, our, to your listeners in, uh, across North America, yeah. uh, domestic refers to both the U.S. and Canada. Okay. Um, so I want to be respectful about that. Um, and, uh, and I get paid 20% of what I bring in for foreign deals, and that is because I split that 20% with a local co-agent who provides me with local knowledge and also muscle for collecting your money in that local country. 
And so um, I don't get paid up front. I'm yeah. not like a lawyer. I don't get paid by the hour. I don't get a retainer. I am paid when I deliver money to you. And when I'm ready to send you money, I take 15% of a domestic deal or 20% of a foreign deal. And I pay myself and I pay the Con Ed bill. Um, you are, um, you know, you have different books you write. So like your book, for, as an instance, uh, the book, uh, You're a Bad B- that's in Target right now. That book has been in Target forever. I mean, it seems like every time I go to Target, that book has another has another version or the subtle art of not giving a n- It seems like that book never goes away. I bought the book, he fought what, maybe two years ago? I mean, when did that book come out? I mean, that book has been around, how long has the subtle art of not giving a n- been around? Just a few years. To, to clarify, the, both of those books are so, were sold by my very talented colleagues, uh, not me personally. And uh, credit, of course, goes uh, to the authors themselves for writing tremendous books and the publishers who help them bring it to market. In the case of You Are Bad, um, that's a book that came out years ago and, in fact, did not find its audience or its um, success until about, I mean, it hit the New York Times bestsellers list two years after it came out. That's a real anomaly. That generally doesn't happen. But the credit for that really goes to the author, whose name is Jen Sincero, because she used her passion for... Uh, coaching people who probably uh, were beginning their uh, success journeys where she had begun hers. And really it was word of mouth that ultimately brought that book so to cool. its audience. Right? And, and ditto for, um, for the subtle art of not giving a bloop. Now how do you, how do you keep track of all these payment sources? Because I work with 160 coaching clients who pay approximately $1,700 a month, some clients more, some less. So if anybody's out there listening, you're doing the math, you go, okay, well, 1700 times 160, and then you know, we make a 20% margin. I'm very transparent about that. But it is, I, I, all of my payments are due on the 1st or the 15th, and my wife is just on it. She's just awesome. But it, it, how do you, because you are like, I mean, you are dealing with creative people that always have a burning fire or something awesome going on or a new idea. How do you keep track of everything? Well, uh, I think um, I'm lucky that I have a wonderful controller and a great finance team here at Foundry. It's one of the benefits of being um, one of the larger agencies in the business. On the one hand, we're independent, so our sole purpose is just working with authors. Um, those are the folks who keep the lights on for us, so they're, right. they're our meaningful business. Yep. But on the other hand, we're, we're big enough. Um, to where so we're independent, and therefore that means that we're we're focused on making money for you the way you're focused on making money for yourself. But we also are big enough to have a really tremendous back office. Your 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 team is awesome. The authors are awesome. It's just it, it's awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, what mentor made an awesome impact in your life? What mentor? And up to this point, were you or maybe mentors? Was, was there somebody in your life that uh, picked you up? that kind of dusted you off, you know, maybe you had a dream and it was kind of drifting or somebody that said, hey, go here, do this. This is how to organize your day. This is how to stay motivated. This is did you, did you have any mentors or a mentor that made a big impact on your career thus far? Well, I'm a big believer that um, you really can learn from everyone. And, you know, a, a person who may or may not be uh, successful in their own life may nonetheless be placed in front of you in that moment to provide guidance in a way that you hadn't seen before. And so I'm a big believer in asking everyone about anything, because you never know, and I, I, that's probably the soul of this show. Um, and, and that's true, especially for, for those who are not in your profession. Uh, naturally, I count my parents as the most influential business and, of course, life mentors to me. But um, I have consistently gained tremendous business insights, believe it or not, from the commercial landlord who Foundry rents the top floor of our building from. Uh, oh. Such as a little bit about one of your earlier questions. He's been an invaluable teacher to me, at beginning with the first piece of advice he ever gave me. Mm. Uh, I showed up, and he was looking to rent an entire uh, New York City uh, you know, office building floor. I did not need an office building floor yet. Um, but I nonetheless began the process of negotiating, figuring, like, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. I'll... I'll, I'll uh, I'll, I'll fill the seats that I need to in order to make this space that felt right for us otherwise work. And so in the process of negotiating with him, I was asking about, like, loss and, you know, the square feet and whatever. 
and he sort of put up his hand and he stopped me and he said, he thought, all that matters is that you want to be here and that I want you here. Mm. And the rest of it, we're going to work out. Mm. It's powerful. And the truth is, if you, if you zoom out and you think about that, that's, that's the right attitude for literally any transaction that you're trying to complete. That right there is, is powerful. I, I, I know that you and I believe in the, uh, the win-wins. Um, you and I believe in, in uh, the golden rule. I know we're on the same page with that. Um, but a lot of people don't believe in that. They believe in zero-sum negotiation. You know, someone has to win. Someone has to lose. Uh, you know, I don't want you here, but I'll do it if you pay enough, that kind of thing. So that's a, that's a, a powerful moment. I, I want to ask you, where does the name of Foundry Media come from? Well, um, so Foundry is a place where steel is forged, right? Uh, my business partner and I did not want our names on the door. We wanted to convey that Foundry is a place where our clients' ideas would be iterated into enduring products. Why do you feel like it had success when a lot of other, um, uh, you know, most other agencies haven't had the level of success that you've had? Why, why do you, what, what do you feel like that competitive edge has been for you? Well, I, 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 would, take, uh, I would take exception. I think it's so many of our uh, colleagues in this business, and that's what makes this business so nice, is that there are so many terrific agents, and it's really just a, a gut check of, of who feels right to you um, as, as your guide um, but I do feel like we try to create um, a home where our authors, again, those be you know writers who consider themselves novelists or people who are experts in the field, can bring their ideas. And then our job is really to, of course, help them understand what the part of their idea, the place, the thing that they're passionate about, where that they work in commercial trade publishing. But beyond that, we really try to encourage our clients to, A, kind of go to the next level with whatever that idea is. What's the like crazy version of what they're thinking of? What's the broadest version that they probably wouldn't normally share? Mm. Um, that's the idea we're interested in talking about anyway. Uh, we'll, we can always walk it back, but let's start with crazy. And what if crazy were possible? Because I feel like in my own life, the only regrets I've ever had is not thinking big enough, right? You know, I, limiting myself has been the only mistake I've ever made. Well, well, I, I, I agree. You, you need to stop going after these small projects like the Elon Musk book. And you need to start focusing on some big things like actually interviewing the, the international leader of Mars. I mean, that, that right there. Now, that would be impressive. I'm just messing with well, you. <laughs> I'm just saying you guys have had some big people. It's crazy. It's crazy, Ifa. You've had, and you're saying even though you've had big, big success, you look back at it and you're saying you wish you would have aimed maybe a little higher. Sometimes, you know, I again, my, you know, my um, my career success has been entirely defined by understanding the difference between what I can do, but what I should do. Mm. Right. So I can, as a person who was trained as a tax tax lawyer you know, do my own tax planning. But that's not the highest and best use of my time as an entrepreneur. The highest best and use of my time as an advocate for my clients is to spend time with them thinking about, you know, strategies for their next move. And that, that uh, idea of, of making a difference, differentiating between what, what I could be spending my days doing and that highest and best use for me and for my clients, that has 100% defined uh, a regular day from an amazing day. Highest and best use. So good. Thrive Nation, if you're listening to this show right now, you should listen to it twice. And you should probably engrave it in a tablet somewhere because there's so much knowledge, knowledge bombs being dropped left and right. Uh, Ifot, what role do publishers play? You know, like Random House... These big names, people go, oh, what Random House, what, what do they do? What do these publishers do? So publishers provide a professional editing job. They lend their goodwill, and their name, to the spine of your book in the marketplace. Uh, hard won, by the way, over many decades. Then they actually pay to produce your inventory, and then they feed that inventory into their established retail distribution system. Now, the rest 
is up to you. You'll notice that I didn't say a publisher will introduce you to readers or they'll publicize or they'll market. There we go. Those core competencies, that, those are up to you because you are in the best position to know your marketplace and your prospective readers. A lot of the books that I own have the Penguin on the side. I had a lot of Penguin. Uh, I've got a few McGraws, a lot of Harper Collins. Um, I've got, you know, I, I've looked at them and I'm just kind of getting prepared for my e interview. I'm just getting a little nervous trying to work through the jitters, you know, and I'm going, I'm going to do the research here. And, 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 and uh, can you explain what, do all publishers take all kinds of books or they all have their different niches or how does that work? So a general trade publisher hires people who are experts in acquiring and then editing all manner of book categories whether that's business, whether that's health, parenting, fiction, fiction for, you know, in science fiction, fiction that is uh, upmarket and talks about you know, beautiful you know, foreign themes. There's an expertise and a tastemaker uh, component to the job of various acquiring editors. There are some publishers who specialize, but generally speaking, the names that you see on the spines of your book and on the copyright pages and title pages uh, represent a large publisher with an imprint. Mm. Otherwise, in a different industry might be called a, a subsidiary that is specializing in a certain category of book. Got it. Got it. Now, um, how do you typically interact with, with your authors? For people out there who want to know, what, what role does the agent have? Because I kind of see you as a coach, as a mentor, as a guide, as a, hey, Mr. Author, hey, Mrs. Author, uh, you need to do this. You're kind of like a, I see you as someone you, that collaborates. I see so many cool things. I, but can you explain what, how you see it? Well, in my view, an agent is meant to be your strategy partner, someone who bridges the gap between your interests and what trade publishing could sell. You know, in, in the best situation, uh, your agent is a roll-up-her-sleeves guide into a new world, and she wants to know what you're most passionate about, but also what part of that fits into your bigger life. What's the version of your writing that will work with your current everyday life? Mm. That's the book that you will sell there we go. and then will continue selling because you won't have to go out of your way to promote this other product that you've created in partnership with a publisher. My job is to remind you of the path that's going to keep you consistent with what you already do in your everyday life. It doesn't help you if I sell a great book for you right. that starts a new business Ugh. that you don't have time to run. Now, and so my job is to be an advisor. You're, you're an advisor, and I think that I, I hope the listeners are getting this. You're, you're definitely not wanting to create cognitive dissonance for, their listener, for, for your authors where they're Writing a book that they can't consistently and sustainably promote because it's not really who they are. I mean, you do a great job of that. And, and I, I think somebody out there is going, okay, EFOT seems like this lady, every, every, all the listeners have been Googling you. I know they have. They, they Google, they, they tell me all the time. They say, I always Google your listeners and check them out. When they're Googling you, uh, I've never met an EFOT before. I've never met an EFOT before. I never, have you met any other EFOTs? Ifat is a name that was popular for five minutes in the uh, era and uh, never really took off. So I have met a few, but we're uh, a limited edition, and we all <laughs> basically know one another. Nice. Okay, so what is the biggest adversity that you've had to fight through during your career, Miss Ifat, limited edition? I think that um, compromise in relationships with those around you is mandatory, but being uncompromising in what you want for yourself, that's been my biggest career lesson. And embracing an uncompromising attitude about what I know to be right for myself mm. has been the secret to any success that I've, I've had. So you know what you and your husband want out of this game called life. You, 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 you know what you want. And you're saying that, that uh, sometimes, you know, the world doesn't want that for you and you're, you're uncompromising. Like, could you give me an example of something that maybe, um, that, nothing super personal, I guess, but, you know, something that you're not going to compromise on professionally or something that you're just like, I'm not 
morally or personally or professionally going to compromise here. And maybe sometimes people want to, you know, have you compromise there. So I represent um, the now late but great comic book creator Stan Lee. And hmm. I was approached by uh, Stan and his co-authors to represent what would be Stan's first adult long-form novel. So if you know anything about Mr. Lee, he's generated more value for, uh, in IP than any other content creator on the planet, in excess of $40 billion. Mm. Uh, and, and yet, despite being a tremendous lover of uh, reading and literature, he had never written a long-form novel like a real adult long-form novel that could also apply for kids as well. Although, you know, they, they had many licensed products that were very popular. Uh, and I was charged with creating, you know, a, a, a situation where he would have a great relationship with a traditional trade publisher. Now, here's the rub. Nobody saw him that way. Mm. His writing was amazing. The work that he did with his co-authors was next level. But convincing publishers that he could produce a work of fiction of the quality that I knew that he would was asking them to take a leap based on materials that they, that they were not used to buying uh, based on the, uh, the kind of materials that I had to show. And so I did something non-traditional. I went to Stan and his co-authors and I proposed that we do the deal in a non-traditional way. I suggested that maybe we first introduce comic book fans who are used to a shorter form of fandom, right, supporting their love of Stan's work. And, of course, Stan has always worked with collaborators uh, with, with an audio original that would bridge the gap between comic book fans and long-form fiction fans. Mm. And we did a really kind of a first-of-its-kind deal with Audible, which is a, a veteran of the publishing industry. And the idea was that the, the story would be told and it would only be available in long form as an original on the Audible, uh, in the Audible ecosystem for some period of time. And then it would be followed by a traditional publishing book in the U.S., in Canada, and then all over the world in translated rights. Got it. And guess what? Mm. I did that first deal, and then crickets. <laughs> um, I still had to sell that. It was about a tremendous deal. It got all kinds of buzz. You know, uh, Mr. Lee was super happy, as were his collaborators. Um, but it was still on my to-do list to sell traditional trade publishing. Once I had exploited audio, which is something that traditional trade publishing, publishing now wants to acquire alongside the print and ebook rights, it was even more difficult to sell publishing rights, print publishing rights. But I didn't compromise. There are many times where I could have just given up, and I knew I had something fantastic, and that I would help my industry understand that this was a voice that was ready to be heard in long form. And I waited until I found the perfect partner for Stan, which turned out to be the same print publisher of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale and the Tolkien Estate, and that's Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And I'm so delighted to say that the results were even more amazing than I could have imagined. And, of course, the client was delighted. You, you are a unicorn. You're a proactive person. Um, you're a business woman, and I think there's a lot of women listening now who are saying, I want to be proactive. I want to be a proactive business woman, and, and, and you know, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, I would just say we have more male guests than, than female guests, uh, not because it's a plan of mine. I just I tend to hang out with uh, more dudes, and there's more women in the workplace that are moving on up, and, and could you um, give some advice to the to the female listeners specifically out there? about how you've been able to stay a proactive person and how do you typically spend the first four hours of your day? I mean, what time are you waking up? What's your routine? So my best days begin when I can 
start earlier than when I'm expected to show up for my family or for the office, obviously, and take a few minutes for myself in the morning, by the way, that, when I say minutes, it could be a few minutes to many minutes, uh, really to think about and think ahead to what I want to achieve in my day. If I'm able to just pause rather than hit the ground running and really sort of struggling, if I could pause, plan, we just review my calendar and then think about what I want to achieve for every one of those meetings or calls, but then also what I want to get out of them right, with what I want to give and what I want to get, where I'm really very clear about that energy exchange, I just observe uh, that the whole day turns out better. I feel like I've uh, entered my day with intention yep, uh, as opposed to constantly trying to catch up. So you, what time do you wake up normally? What's your, what's your normal? Uh, I have to be downstairs and supporting the sort of greater family at 7. When I do things right, I should be getting up at 6. Got it. If I'm not traveling, that's the ideal time for me to wake up. And what are a few of your daily habits that you believe that have allowed you to achieve success? Are you, are you still on the kale-only diet? Are you still only eating kale? I don't only eat kale. Okay. No. If you're going to treat yourself as a machine that you expect to work at 100%, uh, the people who I admire the most and who are the most productive regard that machine with respect. And that means that they set themselves up to win. Uh, any of us who are not uh, teenagers anymore probably have observed that their body operates uh, you know, optimally with some kind of food or some amount of water or some kind of caffeine or whatever it is that it works for you, and just as I would want to think ahead about my day and sort of set myself up to win, you know, making those same decisions that I know set me up to win from a fuel perspective, you know, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, if I, When I do that, I, uh, you know, my day is supercharged. Now, my final two rapid-fire questions for you, Miss supercharged one of an one of a kind limited edition ephot uh total two questions what is an idiosyncrasy that you have that's kind of like your superpower you know steve jobs were the same thing every day uh, I, I i stole that move uh, i know entrepreneurs who uh you know live by their phone that's their super move they're very responsive some entrepreneurs that keep their phone off that's their super move some entrepreneurs that uh have a certain workout routine or a certain mantra a certain flow what is your idiosyncrasy that uh allows you to be super successful what, what's maybe one of them I, I think that the ability to well the inability to listen to something without also thinking what if so there's the way the path is conveyed, right? So here's the path that's being laid out in front of me, and I'm supposed to be doing this. Um, but, you know, there's, a, there's an obstinate kid inside me that loves asking, what if? What if we didn't go that way? What if we went the other way? And that, um, that's kind of squeaky wheel that likes to be a troublemaker, likes to see the alternative um, road into any one of the subjects that I sell books in. That troublemaker continues to be uh, my best asset. Boom. Okay, my final question for you here. Final final question here on the Super EFOT edition, limited edition of the Thrive Time Show on your radio and podcast download. Um, EFOT, what is a message or a principle that you would like to teach all of our listeners? Maybe if you could just send everybody a quick text message, you're like, hey, boom, uh, I want to teach you this move. Here's a little deep thought. Maybe here's a quote. Maybe here's a book you should read. Is there, is there any, what, what's, the, what's the message or the principle that you'd like to teach all of our listeners if you had the chance? Well, I've already told you that one of my favorite things to do is to always uh, ask pretty much anyone, whether they're in my industry or not, whether they're junior or senior to me or not, uh, what their advice is. I'm a big believer in asking other people's advice. It's up to me to ask, you know, to determine whether it's, it's good advice or not. But, you know, it's never hurt me to ask others. But I think the other piece of it that must exist in order for any of that to make sense is this idea that you already know. 
I mean, you know, most of us fail to listen and to honor the knowing in each of us. And I feel like as I become more confident in my ability to deliver success for my authors, the more I honor the knowing in myself that if I really reflect back, kind of had the answer for me all along. Mm. And I, I think that's a gift that you should be giving to yourself every day. I, I'm going to have to uh, listen to this show two or three times, and then when my head explodes each time, I'm going to duct tape it back together. So next time I talk to you, I can have a functional conversation. But you you are blowing my mind. I just want to tell you, thank you so much for taking your time um, to, to meet and connect with our listeners and, and to share your heart and your time. And I know you've got an incredible husband and a great family and and i know he wants to chase you around so i'm gonna let you get back to what you're doing but i thank you so much for your time it's my pleasure and thanks so much for having me on you know i'm a huge fan if you're out there today and you've yet to go to foundrymedia.com i encourage you to do so go up there and then click on the team and you can see the amazing team they've built up there at foundry media and click on the books and you can see all the best-selling books that they've written it is truly impressive what Efot and her team have been able to build over these years. It's just an incredible success story, and I encourage you to believe in yourself and to believe that you have what it takes to become the next great success story, too. Don't stop. This is your year to thrive, and we would love to see you at our next in-person Thrive Time Show workshop. And now, without any further ado, we like to end each and every show with a boom because boom stands for big overwhelming optimistic momentum and so here we go three two one boom 